Okay, I'm going to start recording now. I'm not quite sure how many people are there. It might be three or four. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, <clears throat> and I think that you can actually also see me um, in the top right hand corner, um, as well as seeing my screen which is about, well, it says questions and relative clauses, but actually I'm not going to talk about relative clauses. We'll have a look at them maybe next week. Today will just be about questions. Okay, so <clears throat> there's two basic types of questions that um, appear in the languages of the world. And one of those is what is called polar questions or yes, no questions. They're called polar questions because there are two poles, like two opposites. It can be yes or it can be no. The answer to the question is generally either yes or no, or at least that is the answer that the question is seeking. And then there are content questions, known also in English as WH questions, which are asking for information, not just a yes or a no. And the reason why they're called WH questions in English is that many of the words that we use to ask the questions start with WH. So when, where, why, who. Okay, who is pronounced with an initial H, but it's still written with a WH. And how is now written with a WH as well. But these words, there is some kind of connection between them. And across the languages of the world, we actually see there are multiple cases where people, where, where the language will have these question words, these content question words, starting with the same letters. But we'll see, we'll come back to that in a little while. Okay, so in English, the way that we form one of these questions involves movement of an element to the front of the clause. So in polar questions, it's the finite verb masked by, marked by tense or aspect or, or an auxiliary that, ver that moves. And <coughs> with the content questions, it's the WH word that moves. And we'll see in a moment exactly how that works. It's, um, it's quite um, interesting the way this works and it doesn't happen this way in every language. So here on slide four, what we can see is an English sentence, Felix plays the violin, and the question that comes from that sentence, does Felix play the violin? Okay, so the part, the, the question is possible because does has come to the beginning or Felix is playing the violin, this becomes a question, is Felix playing the violin? Or Felix can play the violin, this becomes a question, can Felix play the violin? Now we see in examples, in the pair of examples C and D, and the pair of examples E and F, that all that is happening is that the auxiliary verb, the is or the can, is moved to the front. But in the case of A and B, something else happens. Felix plays the violin, has to change into Felix does play the violin, and then it is the does that moves to the front. But it, it is a question in English because there is something that has moved to the front. This doesn't work in every language, but for example, in Taipake, um, you would ask to a woman, has, is she married? Are you married? By adding no at the end, and her answer would be, so have become a house, have formed into a household. And in the case of the first one, the order is pronoun, become, house, and then 
this final ga, which is um, like a past tense marker, and then you add no, and the no indicates that this is a question. But the order of the answer is not different from the order of the question. So what's really happening here is that you are adding this particle no to the end. And so you can make a statement in taipake and add no, and that will create a question. In the Mashaung language, in the um, Mashaung Tangsa language, um, you can say ga do ha, did you go? So ga do means you did go. You add ha to the end, ga do ha, it means did you go? So this is different from English. Instead of changing the order of the words, what you do here in Mashaung and also in Taipake is that you add a particle at the end to indicate that this is now a question. So what we are seeing here then is a different kind of, um, two different kinds of structures for these polar questions. One, you reorder the, um, the question, you reorder the sentence, that's the English way. And the second one is the uh, way that is followed in Taipake and also in Mashaung Tangsa, which is to add a particle at the end that indicates that it is a question. Now, before we go on to the WH questions, I'll just mention one more thing about English, because we can ask these questions by using intonation. So if we go back to the sentence, Felix plays the violin, we would normally have a falling intonation on this. Felix plays the violin. But if we say Felix plays the violin with a rising tone at the end, Felix plays the violin, that becomes a question. And this is something which oftentimes second language speakers of English don't learn very quickly, that you can ask a question by intonation. Felix plays the violin, that's a question. Felix plays the violin, that is a statement. And Felix plays the violin with a rising tone at the end is a little bit like making, putting a marker at the end of the sentence. You could also do something like, Felix plays the violin, doesn't he? You can add what's, this is called a tag question. Put, doesn't he, at the end. I think if my memory serves me right, in Assamese, you add something like hoineki at the end to create one of these tag questions, isn't it? Um, so even in English, although we have this structure of turning around the order of the finite verb and the um, subject and putting the finite verb at the front to create a question, there is still something about adding something at the end that, to, that creates one of these polar questions. Okay, but these questions, what they all have in, in common is that they expect a simple answer, yes or no. So if we go back to slide four, does Felix play the violin? The answer would be yes or no. Um, is Felix playing the violin? That means, is Felix doing it right now? The answer again would be yes or no. Similarly, in the uh, Taipake example, are you married? Said to a, a lady. The answer would be uh, yes, or um, uh, or something like that. Uh, something like this, a negative. The answer will be, either yes or no. There's no other information required apart from yes or no. On the other hand, what we call WH questions ask for more information. So um, they're called content questions would be a more generic term or they're called WH questions when they're specifically talking about English. And there are two types of these structurally. Again, 
One of them where you bring the WH word to the front and the second one where the WH word stays in the same position where it would be if the sentence was constructed as a um, normal sentence. And that's called WH in situ. This is a Latin term, in situ. And this happens in Chinese and in other languages and we'll see that situation. We'll see the difference between these in a moment. So in English, <clears throat> when you are questioning the object, um, this is the process. The verb is separated into an auxiliary and a verb. The auxiliary is then fronted as with a yes, no question. And the WH word is then inserted to replace the object and it gets fronted. So let's look at that process. So if we start with the boy saw the birds, the first stage is to separate the auxiliary from the verb. The boy did see the, ver the birds. Then you front the auxiliary. Did the boy see the birds? Then the, the next stage, which I didn't actually indicate, would be to replace the thing you are questioning with um, the WH word. So did the boy see what? And then you front the what. What did the boy see? So there's quite a lot of transformation going on to move the sentence, the boy saw the birds, into what did the boy see? Okay, you have to both, you have to do two separate things. You have to bring the verb to the front. The verb has to be in front of the subject. And in order to do that, you have to divide the verb up into a, um, a finitely marked auxiliary, did, and a root form, see. So the past tense is no longer marked on the um, on the verb, it's marked on the auxiliary did. What did the boy see? We don't say, we don't usually say the boy saw what? Although actually sometimes we might say that, but that's a bit of a special form. The boy saw what? And that would be an example of the WH word being in situ, being in the original location where the birds was. So the boy saw the birds, the boy saw what? But again, when we say that, there's a little bit of rising intonation, which is a typical thing with questions. Now, <clears throat> um, it turns out um, that the final process, the process of shifting the what to the front, might make it seem as if the what has become the subject but this isn't the case because if we say, so taking the sentence, what did the boy see? We make this present. We say, what does the boy see? Whereas, and if we then make this plural, we say, what do the boys see? And the, and the auxiliary verb do agrees with the boys, not with what. And so what you end up having here is a very, um, a very much reordered English sentence. The verb still agrees with the subject. The subject is still the boy or the boys in five. What does the boy see? What do the boys see? So where the, if the boys become plural, the, agree, the verb agreement has to become plural too. So questions have different kind of structures from other parts of language. And then I want to talk about what happens with subjects. So if we wanted to, so if we go back to the boy saw the birds, we have been um, testing how you question the object, namely the birds. So we ask the question, what did the boy see? But with subjects, the process is simpler. The verb is not altered and the WH word is inserted to replace the subject and that's all that happens. So the boy saw the birds is replaced by 
who saw the birds? And that's the only way you can ask that question. So with the object, we could say, um, what did the boy see? And we could also, also say, the boy saw what? With special intonation. But with the subject here, the only way we can say this is, who saw the birds? There is no alternative way of saying it. Now, in Mandarin Chinese, uh, and this is, so Chinese is a very big language um, spoken by large numbers of people, but Chinese isn't a single language. So for a start, there are what are called the dialects, but the dialects of Chinese are more different from each other than at least as different from each other as, for example, um, Hindi and Gujarati and Marathi and most probably Punjabi and Bengali and Assamese. So the so-called Chinese dialects are in fact different languages. And even within Mandarin Chinese, which this is an example of, there are multiple dialects. The, the version that you would learn in a university or in a school if you were studying Chinese is some, sometimes called Putonghua. I don't speak this language, so I don't pronounce it particularly well. Um, <clears throat> and it is a sort of standardized language that once upon a time was not really spoken by anyone, but has become a um, very big international language. Now here we can see um, that in Chinese, the WH words, which both begin with SH, so that's just something to bear in mind that in Chinese, just as in English, um, these questioning words tend to have the same initial letter, in this case, sh rather than w. So if you want to say um, who came, she lai le ne, um, or she lai le ne, something like that, I think it's pronounced, you put the who word in exactly the same place um, if you were, for example, going to say, um, so my wife's name in, in Mandarin is Jing Xiu, um, Jing Xiu lai le, you would say. Um, so you simply replace the word for who, re replace the noun phrase that you are questioning with the question word. And this is called in situ um, WH words. Or if you want to say, you want by what? So let's say you want by book. Um, you could put the Chinese word for book in there. But if you say, you, what do you want to buy? You say, you want by what? And then there's a final particle, no, which um, can be left out. So, ni yao mai shen na, you want by what? And this is called in situ WH marking because the WH marker, the question word, does not move um, from place to place. It stays in exactly the same location where it was before. Okay, now I wanted to mention before that there often is something common between different forms of these um, WH words. And here are some examples in the Mashaung language, um, Tangsa variety spoken in Changlang district, around, around Manmao and also around Karsang. And you'll see that there are multiple words here, but some of them have in common a, um, so on the left hand side, we've got the written form of this uh, language. And in the middle, we have a phonetic transcription. And some of these WH words have an M mm sound at the beginning, which is written with MZ. Z means low tone, so M. Mkoko um, means how. Mchula, how many? Mkatla, when? Mjutla, where? Um, these are all examples of WH words. And just like where, whereas in Chinese, the WH words mostly begin with sh, and in English, the WH words begin with 
WH, here they tend to have this initial M sound. There is a word for what, which is um, YUM, actually YUM, YUM, YUM LI LA, what, um, YUM KUO LA, how. And this YUM might have shortened to UM. That might be how this comes about. So once again, there seems to be some connection between the forms of these different um, WH words across languages. They're not completely um, always the same, but I think if I'm right, in Assamese, question words often begin with K, right? So, um, uh, well, at the end, we might have a chance to discuss that. All right, so <clears throat> can you ask multiple questions in the same sentence? So in English you can, but you can only put one of them at the front. So you can ask the question, who saw what last night? So suppose you meet up with a group of people and you want to ask them, um, you know, what kind of TV programs you were watching last night. You could say, um, who saw what last night? But you can't say who what saw last night. That would not make sense. But in Bulgarian, which is um, an Indo-European language, which has case marking, you can, you can say, and I'm not so sure how that first word K-O-J is pronounced. Let's say it's pronounced Koj. Koj kogo kakvo i pital. Who, whom, what is asked. So Koj is who, that's asking to identify the subject. Kogo, whom, that is asking to identify the, if you like, the indirect object, the one being asked. Kakvo, what is asking to identify the direct object, the thing being asked. So in English, we'd say, who asked whom what? So let's say we have a situation where there's a group of people who are asking another group of people questions about something. And let's say a whole group of students were asking each other questions. And then the teacher comes in and says, who asked whom what? Well, in Bulgarian, they say, who whom what? asked. And that's because each one of these words is marked for a different case. So you can put them in all in front of the verb. So this is, these are all examples of shifting the WH word to the front. In Serbo-Croatian, this used to be regarded as a single language, but for political reasons, it's now separated into Serbian and Croatian and even Bosnian, but they are still very similar and, and I would think mutually, un, mutually intelligible. You can turn the order of these around. So you can say, ko kogavoli, who loves whom, or kogakovoli, whom who loves, same thing. That's the, the ko is questioning the subject, who is doing the loving, and koga is questioning the object, who is being loved. Okay, if we compare Bulgarian and Serbo-Croatian, we can see some similarity of forms. So in Bulgarian, koi or koj maybe, was the subject form and kogo was the object form. And in Serbo-Croatian, ko and koga. So these are very closely related varieties, not fully mutually intelligible, but you can see that they're WH words are alike. Now, it turns out that there is one more pattern for the content words which I wanted to mention. And that's a pattern that as far as I know about only happens in certain languages in Central Africa. Um, and this is information about languages from the northern part of Cameroon. So you can have a look on a map later to see where Cameroon is. But um, Melanie, Melanie Villion, who is um, a former PhD student at my university and has been um, helping out with teaching 
one of the subjects at our university this semester. She did her PhD thesis on a language called Bual, which is spoken in the northern Cameroon. But this pattern is found not only with Bual, but with other patterns. Okay, so in Bual, which is a subject verb object language, um, <coughs> you always put the question word at the end. So here we have um, an example. So the subject is hua, you. The verb is lene, do. And it's got an object marked on it, a subject and an object marked on it. And then um, you have amawal nkwa, to your husband. That would normally be at the end. So whatever it is you are doing to your husband, maybe it's, maybe you are um, criticizing him, maybe you are um, praising him, maybe you are, I don't know what can be there. That action that you are doing to the husband would come normally after the verb lene. But in this language, the WH word, which is veme, what, begins with the letter V and comes to the end. Okay? There's a gap that has been left between the verb lene and the indirect object amawal or amawal and kwa. And the WH word has gone to the end. So this is not fronting it. This is not leaving it where it would be. So it's not fronting and it's not in situ. It is the other, op it is another option which is moving it to the end. And we can see this even with the subject. So <clears throat> when the subject is questioned though, you have to do one more thing. You have to turn it into a relative clause and then put the question word at the end. So what's happening literally here is that which, this ma, the relativizer, deke wala fagwala ku nkha, I don't, can't pronounce this language properly, um, who will bring the wife of this leper? Leprosy is a very bad disease, which is, occurs throughout um, many countries. Who will bring the, the wife of this le leper? Um, it is literally the one who brings me the wife of this leper is who. But notice two things. The WH word is again at the end of the clause and the WH word also starts with V. So we've seen a pattern. WH words in Bual start with V. In Mashaung, they seem to start often with an M. In the Bulgarian and Serbo-Croatian languages, they started with a K. In Chinese, they start with a SH. Okay, so we could call this perhaps fixed position WH, either at the front or the end, because although most of the literature talks about WH structures as being a choice between fronting and in situ, this Bual data suggests there is maybe a better way of thinking about this the fixed position, which is either at the front or at the end, versus leaving the word in the place where it normally would be. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the lecture that I want to give. And what I want to do now is to stop.